Well, I, good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I can have your attention. Good evening. Uh, I'm Ian Whitaker. I'm the Assistant Director for Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And we're pleased to welcome Amory Slaughter back to the Council to discuss her new book, The Chessboard and the Web. That book's available for sale and signing after the program from our partners at the bookseller. Um, after the program, there's also a young professionals meetup at the back of the, uh, the conference center. Um, so we invite our YPs and their guests to stick around, um, have a drink, and, and continue the conversation. A few quick housekeeping points before we begin. We're on the record. Uh, we're live streaming tonight's program, and uh, we always welcome social media, but please silence your phones before you begin. Uh, for nearly a century, the Council on Global Affairs has provided an independent, non-partisan platform for a variety of different perspectives to promote gl deeper global understanding and active US engagement in the world. Uh, views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Uh, some timely upcoming highlights I want to quickly mention. On May 15th, uh, Helga Barth from the German Embassy, Theodor Bromund of the Heritage Foundation, uh, Katerina Sokou of Katha Marini, and Luigi Zingales from the Booth Business School will discuss Europe's year of destiny. That's just almost a year after the, uh, the Brexit vote. And on May 16th, Henri Barkey of the Wilson Center and uh, Stephen Cook of the Council on Foreign Relations will discuss the future of democracy in Turkey. Uh, this evening, we'll hear about the importance of networks uh, in understanding modern-day international relations. Uh, clearly, one of the most powerful global networks is the internet, so we hope that you will utilize this power tonight to uh, ask a, speaker to our question, a question to our speaker using our online application. Just type chi.cnf.io uh, directly into your browser. You can ask a question, and you can vote on other people's questions, too. So now it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker. Uh, Amory Slaughter is the president and CEO of <coughs> the New America Foundation. She is the Bert G. Kerstetter 66 University Professor Emerita of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University uh, and formerly the Director of Policy Planning at the State Department. Um, and Dr. Slaughter will give remarks and then we'll be joined in discussion uh, about our book by Brian Hansen. Brian is the Vice President for Studies here at the Council on Global Affairs. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming Amory Slaughter to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you. I'm always happy to be back in Chicago uh, and to see the council in its uh, splendid uh, new event space. It's a particular pleasure. If you're reading the news right now, and I'm sure we're all reading the news right now, we are very much in a chessboard world. We are uh, playing a game of chicken with North Korea and maybe with China too. Uh, we are fencing with Russia, uh, in both in terms of what we've been doing in Syria and more generally, uh, we are uh, engaged in uh, a, a kind of classic great power uh, combination negotiation intimidation uh, with Russia. Uh, and we, those are just sort of the three powers uh, on the president's plate right now. We could, we could look at Iran uh, and other countries as well. This is the traditional lens of foreign policy. Uh, and I call it the chessboard. Uh, Henry Kissinger would call it the chessboard. Sometimes it's poker. Sometimes it's chicken. But it is always a great power game. And of course, British used to call it the great game uh, in Central Asia. It, it means you take the 200 odd states in the world and distill them down to 20 or 10 or five, uh, depending. And the question, it's a power game. Uh, and it is the, the art of diplomacy or a foreign policy broadly, like chess uh, or poker, is to figure out if I do this, then my rival will do that. Uh, and then I'll do this, and you want to stay one step ahead. And it is uh, familiar and ongoing. So the first point I want to make is that traditional frame, the frame of the chessboard of great power politics, of deterrence, of, of uh, diplomacy or defense or offense, uh, is very much with us. We have strategies for that world. They don't always work, but we have strategies. Indeed, when I was in government, uh, I would often think to myself that what we were 
talking about would fit into one of Schelling's basic categories. Thomas Schelling, The Strategy of Conflict, 1961, where he took the US-Soviet relationship at that point and said, you know, it looks like it's zero sum, but actually, in many cases, it's not. It's actually a bargaining game. And the question is to know, is it chicken, or is it a coordination game, or is it prisoner's dilemma? Uh, and I would sit in Washington and think, I can tell you this is, this is the game we're playing. I didn't. Uh, the word academic is synonymous with irrelevant in Washington. And you are reminded of that at least three or four times a day. So I did not say, actually here, we're in Schelling's second category. But I would think it quietly to myself. Um, those so we know when we look at a, a question of China or Russia and we think, are we going to deter, are we going to intimidate, what, what are we doing? We have these strategies and they are strategies of conflict. What we don't see nearly as clearly, even though we know it's out there, is the web world. So instead of the world of great powers or of states generally, this is the world of networks. And the way to think about it, maybe uh, most concisely, is to think about looking at a map of the world with all the countries, and now think you're in an airplane seat and you pull out the airplane magazine and you open it up and you in the back and you see those hubs with all the flights going from one hub to another. That's the web world. The states are irrelevant. What matters is who's connected to whom via which nodes. Or you could think about a map of the internet. Or you could think of a map of digital flows between nations. Indeed, McKinsey has a connectedness index where it measures the power of different states. It measures the connectedness of different states and hence the power uh, by tracking flows of goods and services and finance and people, obviously, uh, critically, uh, and energy and digital flows. So the world of the web is the world of networks, of networks and, and the flows across those networks. Those can be criminal networks, and obviously terrorist networks are what we all think about. Uh, they can also, of course, be networks of arms traffickers or drug traffickers or traffickers in, in people or intellectual piracy. They can be corporate networks, and for those of you who are from the corporate sector, this is old news. For the last 20 years, corporations have been morphing from hierarchies to network, and supply chains have been morphing into networks of uh, peer co-creators, right, or uh, 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 people who are now in your supply network uh, in ways that are much more uh, horizontal. But of course also there are think tank networks, there are university networks, there are religious networks, there are NGO networks. So the web view of the world in which you look under the surface of the state, over the surface of the state, through the state, however you want to think about it, is very much with us as well. And you need to see both. I, I write in the book about seeing in stereo, really meaning looking at any newspaper article, looking at any situation and saying, here's the chessboard game, the version of this and here is the network version of this. What we don't have is a set of tools for that world. So it's not as if people in government do not realize that there are important networks. And again, with terrorism, you see that every day. Of course we know that there are those uh, networks and that we live in a world of networks. We don't have tools. When government wants to connect people, we convene a summit. So if you think about Barack Obama's uh, speech uh, in June of uh, 2009 about a new beginning with the Islamic world, it seems like a century ago, he pro proclaimed this new beginning. And then what did he do? He called a summit of the on, uh, Middle Eastern entrepreneurs. Uh, we called summits of scientists, we call summits of women, we call summits of African leaders. All of those are great, but a summit is kind of like a listserv that you then never actually address. 
in the sense of you're connected and you were connected for those days and that's terrific, but what happens after that? And just being connected is not enough. We don't, in, in the conflict world, we have this whole set of diplomatic tools and military tools uh, and, and obviously economic, uh, dip, uh, coercive diplomacy, often through economic sanctions. But with networks, we don't know how to create a specific network for a specific purpose. I'm gonna give you a few examples of that and then I think we're gonna, we're, we, we're gonna talk about that. But let me stop first and point out China has a network strategy. China's strategy, one belt, one road, they're about to convene a group of nations to support, in support of that strategy. That is a strategy of building networks of influence through trade, through infrastructure, through uh, human connections, through Southeast, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, all the way to Europe. Uh, one belt, one road, also through, through sea lanes. And when you read that strategy, it is described in terms of networks of influence. That is not surprising. China is the middle kingdom. That's the middle of the world, right? The center of the world. In a networked world, power comes from the center. They, I remember when we lived in Shanghai for a year, looking at the airline maps in China and being quite shocked, because of course the US is sort of off on the periphery somewhere. So they're thinking about the world very much in terms of what are our networks and how do we exercise influence. And the EU has a network strategy, but it didn't get a lot of attention because it rolled out the week after Brexit. So uh, Federica Mogherini spent a year and a half on it. I think it's absolutely brilliant. It, bad timing. Uh, but it, the sort of view of the EU's power in the world is all about networks. And Canada has a network strategy. Uh, and for Canada, that's very interesting because they're not going to be one of the great powers. But they can be very influential, particularly if they tap their own diversity of population uh, and think about how you create networks, if you think of, of individuals as living links to other countries, economic networks, cultural networks, civic networks, uh, and government networks. So that's the, you know, the, this is not, uh, it is not that you don't know we live in a hyper-connected world. We read that every day. What we're missing are those strategies of connection. All right, just a couple more points. So the first is, this is really, as I said, a way of thinking and a set of tools. And I'm not gonna go into the specific tools, but I talk about how to build resilience networks or task networks or scale networks. Who do you connect? How do you connect them? For what purpose? But it's also this just mindset where you can flip from great power politics to network thinking. And I'll give you an example, again, with China. So the Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank, the Asian Infrastructure, yeah, Investment Infrastructure Bank. We, if you recall, China set it up and the United States was, saw this in absolute chessboard terms. One up for China, one down for us. It was going to compete with the Asian Development Bank. The Asian Development Bank's part of the World Bank system. Regional banks, that was our order. It, it, honestly, to be fair to China, you know, Asians have been talking about creating a separate monetary fund. We'd said, no, don't do that. Uh, so they gonna, they're going to set this up. And the United States spends a lot of diplomatic capital trying to convince our allies not to be part of it. And we failed. We failed pretty much completely. Britain was the first to break. France, Italy, Germany stayed with us ultimately, and Japan stayed with us, and pretty much everybody else joined the AAIB. If we thought about it in network terms, first thing we would have just thought about network infrastructure, good thing. Connecting people, we can use that infrastructure too. That's a good thing. We're thinking not about great power states, units. We're thinking about the people in those states and the businesses in those states and the civic groups. Infrastructure is a good thing. So we wouldn't have had that allergic reaction to begin with. But then we would have said, but we really want to influence what is built and what is invested in and how. How would we do that? by having as many of our allies in that bank as possible, 
Right? How do you exercise influence or power through networks? You have to have the nodes, you have to have the connections. So we would have had the opposite strategy. We would have been actively encouraging our allies to participate, better them than us, because if we're in there, that's gonna create a kind of counter poll. The Chinese are gonna probably uh, get more worried. We want people that, who are actively part of the network, but not, not threatening. So we'd have thought about that very differently. Similarly, we'd think about Syria very differently. And we can talk about Syria. And um, all I'm gonna say is that even back in 2012, you could look at it from the chessboard point of view. This is early in the conflict. And you could say, I don't really have a dog in that fight. Turkey's okay, Saudi Arabia's okay, Israel's okay. Those are our principal allies in the region. No reason to intervene. And that is effectively what we did. Remember, 2012, there's no ISIS. There is actually a functioning Syrian opposition. They started marching in 2011. The Syrian opposition marched for six months before they even picked up arms. So still early in the conflict. If you'd looked at it from a network perspective, you would have thought about the people to begin with, what happens when they get driven out of their homes, when their government turns on them. They've got two choices. They will fight or flee. Now, if they fight, they're going to look for support. And where are they going to get that support? Well, through religious networks to other states. Uh, in fact, that's exactly what happened. Qatar and Saudi Arabia were the principal supporters. They had a different view of how that, what that opposition should look like. If they're going to flee, that means massive refugee flows, and this is a country of 22 million people. And you could also think about where are they going to go? Well, you knew they were going to go to Lebanon. You knew they were going to go to Jordan. You knew they were going to go to Turkey. And it wasn't such a reach to think if you really are displacing that many people, they're going to head to Europe. So the network sort of mindset thinks about who is connected to whom and what are the flows going to be along those networks. All right, the last two points I want to make are Thinking about networks as well as the chessboard, the chessboard and the web, also means thinking about power in two ways. If you're at the top of a ladder, if you're at, you have a ladder, power comes from the top. The person at the top of the ladder has the most power. Everybody, otherwise, somebody is above you and <laughs> can kick you down the ladder. If you are in, the, in a web, power flows from the center and you have no direct command over anyone. So another way to think about this is if you are in a hierarchy, if the latter, it's power over. You have power over the people beneath you, and they have to do what you say, or at least in theory. Um, if you're in a web, there, you have no direct power over anybody. You are connected to people. You have power with them. And you have a lot of power with them. If you're connected to enough people and you can convince them to all to pull in the same direction, you can overthrow a government. Or you can make major change in pretty much any context you think of. Or you can establish you know, a new regime, although it, it is harder to govern that way. But the way you exercise power and think about it and exercise it is very different in the web uh, than it is in the chessboard. And finally, the way you lead is very different. There are many theories of leadership uh, in a hierarchy, uh, but they all do, in the end, uh, assume that you, are, you actually have co the power of coercion. In the web, when you are leading from the center, uh, I talk about five Cs of the way you lead. You think about, you curate, because most important when you're building a network is who's in it. Can't be everybody connected. That's useless. You have to have specific entities or people connected. And then you have, so you have to think about curation. Then you have to connect them and how. And just as a classic example, do you do it digitally or do you do it physically or you do it both? Um, how are you going to connect these folks? Then you have to cross fertilize among them, and that takes a lot of work. You, you, the network will not spontaneously start. Uh, exchanging information or, or, or uh, other kinds of uh, ways of, of influence. So you have to, you have to cross fertilize. You have to cultivate the relationships in the network. So think again, if you were wanting to build networks of entrepreneurs across the Middle East, you, you can connect them, figure out who they are, uh, you curate, you connect, you 
cross-fertilize, you have to then cultivate those relationships. You have to bring people together who you know will actually be, uh, want to know each other. And you have to do that quite intensively. And then finally, you have to catalyze action. You have to act, be there, the, a network manager or a collaboration manager. One of the new terms is systems entrepreneur. You can take whichever term you like. Uh, but that is a set of skills that exercises power through a network, that designs the network, builds the network, and mobilizes the network that we, again, have paid very little attention to. We don't, it's hard for us to define it. I just gave you three names. Those are not names you see on, in the uh, Craigslist, you know, wanted a network manager, wanted a systems entrepreneur. But in a world in which we need to be designing and building networks just as much as we need to do traditional defense and diplomacy and development, those skills uh, are every bit as important. So I'm going to leave it uh, here as a, uh, until we turn to conversation, but I hope that when you pick up the paper tomorrow and you read about those great powers, you also ask yourself, what are the networks underneath? Who's actually driving this, not from the foreign office, but from CEO boardrooms, from civic organizations, or possibly from criminal networks? Thank you. The watch was there, so I was <laughs> Thanks, Anne-Marie, and thanks everyone for being here. It's great to have you back here at the Council, and uh, terrific to have a chance to have this uh, conversation. This book is a terrific book. Um, you got just the tip of the iceberg of really the analysis of how networks can help us think about foreign policy, so I'd encourage people to take a, take a look and, and read it. You laid out a bunch of the arguments and mechanisms. And what I'd like to start off doing is just applying it to some concrete examples. You used examples of how the Chinese are, are using thinking about networks, how the Canadians are. Um, and you talked a little bit about how our, our not thinking in networks uh, led to a set of policies in Syria, which maybe didn't serve us very well. I was wondering if you could start by taking one of the major challenges that, that we face, whether it's you can pick, whether it's Russia or North Korea, um, if take, your, take your pick, and lay out what a US strategy would look like that really embraced this thinking. What would we notice, and then what would our strategy be to respond that would go beyond just the chessboard? Okay. Fair, totally fair question. So with North Korea, I have to start by saying it's really tough. I mean, North, North Korea is as a 99% chessboard problem. And it is deliberately so, it, it is so because the North Korean government exercises power by severing connections with the rest of the world, right? So they want it that way. They do not want anybody to have channels of influence. And you're actually seeing other governments exercise that uh, power too. And at the end, I, I talk about open versus closed. There are some networks with North Korea, more than many Americans realize. I didn't realize that Sweden had an embassy in Pyongyang, because we don't, and so in our ethnocentric way, we assume that the whole world uh, it does not. There are also some religious networks uh, that, that can be worked, but by and large, this is really a chessboard problem. So I'm not gonna, I don't have a solution there. With Russia, well, the first thing to point out is uh, you don't build the network in the crisis, right? So I cannot tell you, oh, you know, we did, Russia just you know, invaded a country, we should build a network. That is not going to work. Uh, it is it, part of the difference between the web and the chessboard world is the time frame. Uh, and, and really, uh, the web world requires longer term thinking. However, this is what, so here's what I'd be thinking about. In Ukraine, I'd be building resilience networks, which means in a resi there, are many there are several different kinds of resilience networks, but a defensive resilience network makes it very hard to knock out just a few nodes and take down the whole system. 
So even militarily, you would be putting your bases uh, or your military installations not near your cities, right? So that you can't just conquer a city or take, conquer is a little old fashioned, but <laughs> take over a city uh, and, and immediately then uh, uh, have also the military power or vice versa. You can take over the military installation, but you haven't actually uh, taken over the city. Uh, you can think, you really want to think about building a grid of distributed resources, knowing that you know, whatever happens, Russia is going to continually try to destabilize. So you design a network that will mean, okay, you got this node, but just like if you think about building a power grid where you don't want to take out one node and have everything else go out, so you very carefully distribute uh, your, your uh, energy uh, nodes very broadly. So that's one thing I do. But then second, I would really be much more systematic about using university, well, this is tricky, building networks of Russians who've been educated in the United States. So I had to be careful because you don't use a university, right? <laughs> Having been in universities for much of my life. You know, if Washington called up Princeton and said, okay, we'd like to hijack your alumni network, the re response is not great. On the other hand, Washington has great convening power. And to convene the heads of programs from major universities that have Russian students, many of our business schools have those graduates. Those graduates, you, you know, uh, they came here, uh, they speak English, they, in, they certainly absorb some of our business practices, one hopes cultivating those networks, knowing who they are, knowing how the, the, you know, the part of this would be, you know, do you create specific groups and you have different alumni networks? That, that's an example of, A, you may have more channels of influence and intelligence uh, than otherwise, but B, let's say Putin goes down tomorrow. This is the difficulty of chessboard uh, politics. When the government goes, <laughs> your relationships go with it. This would be much more strategic. And the same thing with scientists, uh, probably also with environmentalists. We have some of those networks, but the, again, it's not strategic. And I would think very strategically about the channels of influence and what, the, what we would need from those networks down the road. Terrific. I, I like that example because it took a very traditional issue, right? State to state right. relationships and showed why this could, uh, what you get from thinking of this way. Another major threat, of course, the, the threat that's been that the Trump administration has identified as the most important threat to the United States, in their view, is terrorism. Now, terrorism is a classic networked threat, right? So, in this view, how do we think about responding to terrorism? So again, it depends on the time frame. Uh, one of my central examples uh, borrows from Stan McChrystal, who wrote this book, Team of Teams. And he describes showing up in, in Iraq, and he's in charge of al-Qaeda in Iraq. I, I'm sorry. He's in charge of the special <laughs> forces who are supposed to be fighting al-Qaeda in Iraq, just trying to see if anybody's listening. Uh, the, uh, and, so that's why he lost his job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he describes, and the special forces are the most nimble part of our military. So you would think if anybody's going to operate in a network, it's going to be the special forces. They operate in small groups or connected to other groups. And he says, he gets there and he discovers that al-Qaeda in Iraq is an extremely nimble and adaptable network. So, of course, we attack them. Uh, they lose a couple of people. They lose equipment. And, and he says very quickly, uh, cars drive up. They, they, uh, the people who are still living uh, disappear, regroup, and adapt their strategy very quickly to whatever it is we just did. So he describes very, very systematically how he took what was a, a structure, essentially a hierarchy, with he's up here and he's got these different groups of special forces uh, below him, into a team of teams. And how it was a network that could come together where everybody was connected for communications purposes, because you had to have shared consciousness, you had to know what was going on across the whole network for communications. And then what he calls empowered execution, where Diff small groups, but small groups all connected to people in other groups had the ability to act on their own. 
So that's an, uh, it's what I call a task network. That's a highly operational network designed for a specific purpose. I think you also uh, though can, can think, so if you're thinking about countering terrorism uh, more broadly, then you get back to resilience networks. And one of the things we are thinking about with our critical infrastructure is how you avoid the situation, we often have it in cybersecurity, of what's called a scale-free network. So a scale-free network, you get some really big nodes and then lots and lots and lots of little people connected. So think about the internet. Think about the huge portals, right? If you take down some of those biggest nodes in the internet, the whole system will come down. So again, it depends what you want to do with respect to terrorism, but if it's resilience or defense, there's one uh, set of architecture and, and a way to, to create it. If you're thinking task, there's a very different one. Terrific, uh, very, very helpful examples. As you look at President Trump uh, and map him on the stereoscopic vision of chessboard or web, where would you locate him? One could say he's a classic chessboard guy. Is that too simple? Well, so I do think, I think this administration, I'm not just going to say President Trump, but I, I think this administration is highly chessboard focused. I think President Trump actually obviously thinks in terms of business networks and um, We'll see where those business networks uh, take him and us. Uh, but so that, if I were to say to him, you need to exercise power and influence through networks, I don't think that would strike him as strange. But I think his foreign policy team is highly chessboard focused. And I have to say, Secretary Kerry, although I admire him in many ways, was very chessboard focused. Secretary Clinton. In part, I know she liked networks because she hired me because of an article I wrote about power in the networked age in 2009. And she liked that. She liked the network image. Uh, she deliberately hired or created positions for an ambassador to women around the world, an ambassador to youth around the world, an ambassador uh, for uh, innovation, uh, for tech delegations around the world to look for tech entrepreneurs, an ambassador to Muslim majority communities. So she was thinking about web diplomacy together with traditional chessboard diplomacy. So you have an ambassador to Russia, and you have an ambassador to women or to scientists or to some group. And that, so I think, and, and that I hope we will get back to, but I can't say I'm all that optimistic we will in the next four years. Okay. Looking forward, one of the things that you propose in the, in the book is you lay out a three-part grand strategy yes. that you, you argue is particularly well-suited for a networked world. You talk about the three pieces being open society, open government, and open international system. Can you unpack those a little bit? What are each of those three, and how do they fit together? Yes, yeah, Serge Schmemann in the New York Times said that, uh, yeah, obviously I finished this book before the election, and he, he said, what would have seemed anodyne now sounds like a brave tribute to the values of another world. Uh, so, <laughs> That's going to be my next question. Okay. So, yeah, okay. For, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I don't, uh, it, things have changed, but I'm not alone. Tony Blair had a long piece in the Times a while back, or maybe it was the FT, about open versus closed being the new dividing line uh, as opposed to democracies versus non-democracies. That This was the axis of differentiation. And the U.S. is far more, uh, at least rhetorically, President Trump has been much more about closed, right? Walls, trade wars, protectionism. We haven't actually seen him do all of that, and certainly his strike on, on Syria for chemical weapons, that was upholding an open uh, international order. But here's how I think about it. Open society, well, okay, you know, for those of us who remember going through the Cold War and what happens after the Cold War, an open society is a democratic society. It's a society in which you have civil society, civic groups who are able to actually act fairly freely. Same with business, same with um, uh, the, the essential basic liberties of a liberal uh, democracy. Uh, it does not mean that it, you don't have borders. Uh, and it does not mean, even if you think of trade, not completely open to trade. The, the 
uh, order of post 1945 was built on what John Ruggie called embedded liberalism, which essentially meant you trade, but only to the extent you are taking care of your people. Uh, and I would certainly subscribe to that. So it's qualified open, but it's basic. The, the notion is you have an open society. Open government is what President Obama pioneered. I was there at the beginning where he said essentially there was an open government partnership. The United States and Brazil and a couple of other countries created it. Uh, and countries then pledged tr to transparency, accountability, and participation. Now that sounds a lot like liberal democracy, but it's important that it isn't couched in you must have, you're, we're starting with elections. The point is any government can pledge to greater accountability. There are other way, there are many ways to hold people uh, accountable, transparency and, and participation. Obviously that assumes uh, some degree uh, of, of democracy. Uh, and then finally an open international system, open in two ways, open to new powers and open to web actors. Open to new powers, I just think we are, uh, well, we may be accelerating the decline of the 1945 order right now, but even if we're not, do you really believe in 2045 we're gonna be run by the victors of World War II, the world is? I just think that's crazy, right? We have to adapt. I, you know, a lonely voice for Security mm -hmm. Council reform, but if we don't get it, the Security Council just will become increasingly irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, so open to power relations, shifting power relations, uh, and open to web actors. So take a look at the Paris uh, Agreement on climate change. One of my former students just told me that actually all the cities, there's 7,000 cities signed up, and they are part of that agreement. That is an open international order that open to, to, to sub-state actors like mayors and also uh, NGOs and businesses. And my student told me that actually the U.S. cities and the, the non-federal government participants will actually be able to have uh, as much impact uh, as the federal government could have had. Now, it'd still be better with the federal government, don't get me wrong, but still enormous impact. So those are what those three things mean. Terrific. And with the recent elections that we've had in the <laughs> politics, the rise of populism, much of which has been couched against networks and the perceived winners of yes, the network yes. state, right? A, a kind of called globalization. Um, and the reassertion of the state uh, in order to get control back. Yep. And some of those narratives are about the people who are losing from this networked world, reaching to the state um, in order to restrike the balance. How does this kind of politics affect the ability of networks to perform these roles and, and how important they are in politics today? I'm not sure I would run on the web world. I mean, in other words, I do think that uh, the open versus closed is, for instance, is being framed in ways that are politically uh, sensitive or, or inflammatory, really. Uh, but here's how I would think about it. The problem of people who've been left behind by globalization is precisely that they are disconnected. Right? The web frame says problems come from, you know, con no connection, from connection, from disconnection, and from misconnection. And often what you're seeing are people uh, who are, uh, indeed if you read uh, Hillbilly Elegy, which is hardly the only thing to be reading, but one of the things he makes so clear, and the same is true uh, in, in um, uh, Arlie Hochschild's new book, is just this complete divide between people in communities that have no way of getting to a higher education, a higher education that can actually get you a job, knowing what to do when you get there, because you've got such segregation of rich and poor, he describes just not having basic social capital, right? Not knowing how to eat properly, not knowing what you do when you actually get uh, into a situation uh, when, when he finally gets to college, which is something that all of us who are parents are familiar with, but we are connected and we know how to, to connect our, our children. So the way I think about that is how do we connect those people to networks? But equally importantly, how do we reconnect people in a community like Chicago to each other? 
Now, this is more true of the hollowing out of smaller communities. Chicago is just segregation, but in many communities, what you, you no longer have the, you know, the, the school principal, the sports coach, the minister, the civic leaders, the corporate leaders, and the mayor. You need all of those people, and they need to be connected. And I write a lot about uh, civic networks and how important they are for resilience, but also for renewal. Uh, the other thing we need to focus on is not just connecting upward, but connecting across. So I would say the problem is they're not enough networks, not that, that uh, there are only global networks. And to what extent, given the poli this politics, this backlash politics, to what extent can states actually shut down networks, become gatekeepers, disrupt this source of, of power? Uh, quite effectively, uh, at least in the short run. So we would not have thought China could really shut off the internet, but it essentially has. I mean, there are plenty of Chinese who can get past the Great Firewall, but it's also true that if you are an ordinary Chinese citizen, what you're going to see and whom you're gonna be connected to is quite controlled by your government. And of course, they hire vast numbers of people to monitor uh, what's on social media uh, and to make sure uh, that people who are broadcasting things they, sh they don't want broadcasted or shut down. So, you know, in many ways, I would say the internet, like the physical territory of the Iron Curtain, and it's, try explaining to, to your children what, what the Berlin Wall was or the Iron Curtain. It's like, what? You know, what are you talking about? Why don't you just send a message? You know, what, what is the Berlin Wall? <laughs> but um, that ability, it, it, you know, you, you actually can do that digitally too. Or you can look at uh, the laws that Russia has and India increasingly has against foreign NGOs. That's severing those connections. That's severing those channels of influence because that's uh, understanding that that's power and that's empowering people against the government. So I'm an optimist. I think, yes, it's absolutely possible, and the open versus closed axis is going to be increasingly important. But I also think, notwithstanding the Soviet Union's effort to do that physically for most of my early life, sooner or later, and if you go back and look, you had religious networks, you had solidarity in Poland and the Pope, and you, you know, no wall could stop that. You had human rights networks, you had, you had journalists and a few students, and that, that wasn't everything. Econ the economic crisis of the Soviet Union was a huge piece, but once that started to crumble, how countries could shape that and determine their destiny was a function of their being connected. And even more important than once they went down, the EU, the wall went down, the EU was there, and then these countries were absorbed into EU networks. So I am, I ultimately think uh, open will win, but I don't think that's going to be fast, and I don't think we should underestimate the ability to close. Terrific. I want to look at it from the other side now, which is in the United States, where we have a relatively open society. Uh, we have seen with the interference of U.S. elections, other European countries have had similar interference with their electoral process. We've got the uh, concerns about fake news and, and where it comes from. Some people are wishing for hierarchies back in media, yes. for example. Um, <laughs> but to what extent are these threats to the United States? And does that mean that we need to respond in some way? If people are able to take advantage of this openness against us, how do we respond to that? I think this is one of the really important questions that I would be grappling with uh, in, in the White House or in the State Department or the other, other departments, which is to what extent do we both create and use offensive networks? So when New America had our cybersecurity conference, we had people there from all different parts of the cybersecurity world, including privacy advocates, the civil liberties side, as well as the defense side. But there was remarkable agreement that we should have struck back much harder against Russia. I was sort of surprised. I hadn't really thought about this. But the point was, 
we responded in a chessboard way. Secretary, uh, you know, President Obama expelled some diplomats uh, and imposed sanctions. That's chessboard uh, politics. The argument was, you know, if Putin's going to do this, he's got to discover that we can do this to him too. Now, he would say we'd already been doing this to him. I mean, he obviously thought Secretary Clinton or the U.S. had been behind the demonstrations against him in 2011. But this was taking it to a whole different level. And the, the claim was made, and I, I thought, I'm sympathetic that we should have hit back in a way, not directly, but you know, some of his secrets suddenly were out there uh, and secrets he really didn't want known. We know we did something like that with North Korea after they hacked Sony. I don't know what, I'm not sure, I mean, nobody, maybe somebody in this room knows what, most people don't, but we do know that North Korea has not hacked anybody else since. And I don't think that's just accidental. So I think this question of, and it goes back to the same issues we used to have offensive, defensive, you know, arms uh, in, in the Cold War. What, to what extent do you create offensive networks and when do you use them? Uh, and again, that's gonna be the game of deterrence uh, and tit for tat. And in that sense, you could say you create networks for chessboard games. Terrific. Well, I want to have an opportunity to bring the rest of you uh, into this conversation. So let me open it up. There are mics circulating around the room. Since we are being live streamed, please wait for the mic to arrive so that people can hear your question. And I've got one right in the back right here, the gentleman right there. You, you talked a little bit about the, over, the interplay between the network and the chessboard, right? You said, yes, you got to see right. it both. And, but when you talk, and now I want to go back to your experience in state, and you talked about personnel being specific for the network. Can we, is there any consideration of how you change the chessboard personnel to be more sensitive to the network? Because it seems like desk officers or embassy personnel, they have what, what seems to me a, too short of a tenure to really get into this new network world, and they're still set up to be chessboard personnel? That's, that's a great question. So aside from ensuring that we have 50% women across the board, uh, the, uh, and I'm, I'm only half joking because when I would give this lecture at state, uh, early versions of what became this book, I would give it at the Foreign Service Institute, and all the women and everybody under 35 would be nodding vigorously because they, you know, were con I mean, connected. Duh, of course you're connected. I'm, I'm, I don't think my son actually knows how to act as an individual agent. He kind of moves as a blob right, with his friends. Uh, so, but uh, and women, I don't think this is biological, but I do think since we have not traditionally been able to exercise power at the top of a hierarchy, we've gotten really very good at exercising it laterally. So I think it's a way of thinking that many women uh, find congenial. Um, but you're, the other point, and it's a very important one, there's one about how much we rotate people, and yes, I mean, honestly, the rotating every three years because we're afraid people will go native, that dates from the early 50s. Uh, and maybe we could now say, no, actually, we need deep expertise, <laughs> and we, it, like our, our fellow countries leave people, you rotate around a region, but you, you stay in that region. But even more radically, I would overhaul the Foreign Service. Uh, it was last really changed in 1925 when the Consular Service and the Diplomatic Service merged to be the Foreign Service, 1925. Also some reforms done in the early 80s, but I would overhaul the whole idea of the 30-year upward carefully control career and make it possible for folks from NGOs and folks from business and folks from civic, you know, all universities go in and out, not just at the political level, that's the very top, but all the way through. Because then you'd have these networks. Part of the problem is we've got great foreign service officers, but A, you know, they're not there that long, and B, when you say to them, okay, you need to bring together civic and corporate actors in a network, they don't know anybody. How are they supposed to? They know the diplomatic world. So you really need to think about how do we tap what, what is an extraordinary resource for the United States. We have fabulous global networks. How do we, we create what one of my friends calls tri-sector athletes, you know, who would move from all three sectors. Uh, you, you, you really need to, a big overhaul. 
All right, in a, in a program on networks, I have to take the online questions, of oh, course, yes. too. And let me start with the one that's gotten the greatest support, uh, which is, what do you think of a country like Switzerland, who embrace, embraces isolationism, or at least independence, and why are they still so successful? So Switzerland, country on its own, not in NATO, um, but a country that seems to be highly successful, um, that operates like a state, is the question here. Oh, boy. Well, let's see. They gave women the vote in 1971, so I'm going to start by questioning how successful they are for all <laughs> Swiss. Uh, and they have lots of issues around immigration and work. They, they need some immigration, but they're very uncomfortable with it because they're not uh, open. Um, but the, so again, that to me is in terms of renewing your population, your culture, your ability to succeed. Uh, I think they're they're uh, they've got they've got some troubles. But what I would mostly say is the Swiss is that the Swiss are that successful because they are at the center of secret global financial networks. And that if you, and <laughs> they've done very well out of that, right? I mean, and we've, there've been some re removal of bank secrecy laws through terrorism, et cetera. But if you did, I've got an article coming out with a co-author uh, in the Washington Quarterly talking about transparent corporate ownership. So just making it clear who owns who, just taking those networks and making them transparent. Switzerland would, Swiss, the Swiss economy uh, would be deeply affected. So uh, I think, and, and I have nothing against the Swiss, I really don't, and it's a great country in many ways, but I would say, um, A, they're a little less successful than the questioner asks, and B, their success is indeed dependent on networks. Terrific, let me bring it back to the room here. This woman right here, please, up front. Earlier you mentioned that um, as a leader with that network thinking frame of mind, you need to curate, connect, cross-pollinate, cultivate relationships, and catalyze. Yes, those are the five could you, C's. Could you say more about how an individual could be more of a network thinker and how you cultivate your competence in that space? Uh, aside from memorizing my book. Um, <laughs> start by reading it. That would be a good start. No, this is, this is very important. It's important for individuals, but it's also important for employers and heads of organizations because you can develop these skills, but part of the reason I'm emphasizing this is because we need to have this job category and we need to pay for it. And honestly, in some cases, we all know networkers and connectors, and you read the tipping point, you know, those people who just somehow always know what's, not just what's happening, but who to put you in touch with if you need something. That work is often not recognized. It was often done by women uh, in neighborhoods, in, in communities. It, it is, uh, it's, you know when it's not there, but you often don't recognize it or pay for it when it is there. So part of what I would say in terms of developing it, I really lay out, okay, this, you need to think strategically or systematically about building a network. You don't just connect people. And again, if you think, you think about, I'm just as the head of an organization, all right, who are the people who need to be connected for this purpose? Do they need to be connected just all as one group, or do I need to create pods of different people and connect them? Do, is, does there need to be one center, or can there be several centers? So you, you, you can learn to think strategically about it. That's what the book does in terms of looking at network theory, and believe me, I looked at network theory in 10 different disciplines over 10 years so that you wouldn't have to, uh, it, it's, uh, and you distill it. Uh, but then thinking about the cross-fertilizing and the cultivating, uh, partly it's personality if you're good at that and it comes naturally, but what's critical is to then say, as I often say to funders or to foundations, I say, if you want this to work, you want to scale network, 
for instance. You want to take together all those great th projects you are funding, and you want to make that greater than the whole of its parts. You have to pay people to do this. And they, so we didn't used to advertise for curators, not outside of art galleries. Now that's a job ca category, right? They're curators all over the place. You curate uh, news, you cur curate stories. I want to make the same of a network manager, or as I said, a collaboration manager. And Jeff Walker's written a book where he's, he calls it now systems entrepreneur, and maybe that's the way to go. But you need to educate your employer about what it takes to make this go, so that if you, even if you have the skills, you can actually get paid for it. Another web-based question. Um, how can a web structure, as opposed to a hierarchy system, begin to tackle big issues like climate change or terrorism? Do they lack the effective leadership they need for our big challenges? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to have that question because I should say that there's no organization that is all web or all hierarchy. So think about the military, which is the most hierarchical organization you could imagine. And then there you have Stan McChrystal saying, we couldn't do what we needed to do without making it a web. And, and or more, more of a team of teams. And even before that, the military was realizing that hierarchy was deterring people at the bottom from telling people above them what they needed to hear, not surprisingly. One of the reasons I'm on Twitter is people say all sorts of things to me that they no longer say in my day job. Uh, and I find that useful. Uh, but so there were all sorts of ways of trying to get people on the front lines to communicate more laterally. Uh, the flip side is Wikipedia, which seems like a complete web. Anybody can go on, anybody can, can uh, contribute to an entry or rework it. Well, not really. At the core, there are about 50 people, and there is a hierarchy. There's a boss uh, and, and people who are told what to do and who need to do things. So I would say at, you ne a complete web can pro might work for overthrowing something, but I, even there, you're going to have more hierarchy than most people uh, see or designated leaders. Uh, and for uh, most things, the question is rather, what's the percentage web versus percentage hierarchy that is best needed for this? Uh, and I would say for governing, Obviously, you would think you need more uh, of a hierarchy, although, again, not as much as we have now. The most exciting work in government is uh, what I call government with, like power with, where government is working with citizens to create services rather than delivering them for them. Uh, but, th but it's an important point that you can't have all one or all the other. Terrific. Back to the room. This gentleman right here in the middle, please. So I view the chessboard as being um, something that we can all relate to because of the ability to measure probability. So when we're looking at the web, um, it, w how much are we able to translate the ability to measure probability into the web? And also when you're comparing webs, how do you measure the benefits of two webs uh, to each other? Um. I very much hope that this book will help launch a field of study that will help you answer those questions. And I'm not being facetious. I'm not just ducking your question. I really, I wanted to write this book for 10 years, really as a scholar, because if you look back at Schelling's strategy of conflict, he just laid out these three basic games and a framework for how we should think about relations between nations. Our ability to assess that probability in the chessboard world is in part a function of the fact we've had 40 to 50 years building on that framework. If people start thinking about networks strategically and what the structure is and how it's run and how broad it is, we will develop those metrics and we will be able to assess the strength of different networks. Now there's a lot of theory, and I talk about some of it, about uh, things like different kinds of centrality. So I said, you know, power in a network comes from being at the center, but there's lots of different ways of being at the center. And I'm not going to go through it here, but there's betweenness centrality, there's eigenvector centrality, there are all these different ways of measuring uh, who's at the center and what kind of power that is. But I truly hope, at the end of the book, I say, you know, I ran a public policy school and you 
when you leave a pub, leave the school, you know a good bit of economics, you know some statistics, uh, you know some politics, some uh, uh, psychology, judgment and decision making. You don't know anything about technology or networks. And that actually we teach you to write memos. I, I hope in five to 10 years, drawing a network map will be absolutely as common as writing a memo and helping people see here's the set of relations and here's what we need to do. Terrific. Yes, gentlemen, right over here. Hi. So after 9-11, uh, we saw governments uh, enact all sorts of measures to protect the citizens of those countries and those nation states. Um, today, a teenager in the middle of the U.S. in Iowa can watch a video on YouTube from ISIS and put everyone's lives at risk. So my question is kind of twofold. So one, um, how do you see this problem being addressed? How do you see it playing out 20, 30 years from now? And whose responsibility ultimately is it to address that particular scenario? I think that is exactly uh, a scenario of designing counter networks. So the first thing we, will, we are doing already and we will do more of is to use various kinds of predictive analytics to be able to identify that person, preferably earlier on. Uh, Often what we will then find is somebody who's quite isolated uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, some of which may just include teenagehood, having raised two teenage sons. Uh, but part of what you then do as the counter network, because part of what ISIS is offering or Al-Qaeda or any of these is a you are part of a community. You are part of something, a community that's like a family, particularly for kids who are looking for an alternative, uh, and, and a larger purpose. Now, there are many ways of creating that, closer to home and much better. Often it's going to be probably through a mosque or through a church or through a community uh, center. But that's exactly where the problem is that we've got a situation where they are connecting to networks that are very strategically using social media, and we do not have a networked response, neither to find them uh, nor to, to then think about how you provide uh, an alternative. That's not a panacea, but if you think that way, you know, for me, when I hear that question, I immediately map what are the networks that, that are the problem, and then how do we create the networks that can be part of the solution. Terrific. Um, yes, right here, please, on this side. This past year has seen a reaction against globalization, and your distinction between the chessboard, which I interpret as being sort of the traditional Westphalian system of states, yeah. versus the web, which is a collection of non-state actors, global corporations, financial institutions, whatever, NGOs. Um, it raises the question of legitimacy because part of the reaction against globalization in he, uh, the US, Britain, um, other parts of Europe has been the fact of traditional uh, communities being impacted by the changes brought by globalization and not having a voice in it. Yep. And would creating or cultivating a network strategy exacerbate that problem by having more non-state actors which are not responsible to the public you know, generate more attention that we've been seeing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I, I just finished David Goodhart's Road to Somewhere. David Goodhart's the editor of Prospect magazine in Britain and voted against Brexit uh, and was a sort of labor, laborite or center, center left, but is looking at exactly these questions. So he divides the voters for and against Brexit into the uh, anywheres and the somewheres. And the anywheres have networks. There are a lot of us in this room. We are networked to each other and to people all over the world. So I can, and I often feel like I live in airport world and I am likely to see other people I know in airport world. And then when I land, if I'm going to a conference, I have these networks, but they are not attached to any one place. So those are the anywheres versus the somewheres, people who are still, their lives are still far more rooted in one place. Nobody completely, anybody, I mean, everybody uses a computer, but more so. Uh, 
that's just a, a lens, but it's, he's got a lot of statistics, but, but it is, gets at the question you're asking, which is that, the fo that what he's saying is that the British government has reflected anywhere values much more than somewhere values in terms of the policy that is ma was made, and that that is seen as increasingly illegitimate. You know, wait a minute, why should we be funding foreign students or, or, or uh, create, uh, opening our universities in, to be supported by foreign students in various ways? Why should we be bringing in very uh, you know young hungry eastern europeans when we've got you know teenagers right here who need training etc that so so i do think the way i would i think you're right uh, i don't think and i this is not an argument for let's just everybody be connected globally quite the contrary i do think there you need counter networks and you do need borders indeed uh, you would say uh, in many ways, again, if you think about embedded liberalism, one way to think about it is only if your own social and political and economic networks are healthy should you be opening uh, to others. But I think it's, again, it's a way of thinking about the problems. Uh, as I said, if when I look at a lot of communities, I see problems of disconnection. But it would then say, if I were in the government, I need to be focusing more on the connections within my society, top to bottom, but also laterally and also very much geographically, uh, before I, I then think about the broader networks or at least at the, at the same time. Yeah, please, right over here. This isn't as related to the networks, but more so to the chess game. What do you think the effect of posturing with the United States where we're saying that the aircraft carrier is off the coast of North Korea, and in fact it's not. What do you think the effect of that is for I our missed the news today, but okay. <laughs> upcoming foreign policy when we're dealing with such a chess uh, game uh, you know, situation? Yeah. So I have not, uh, I'm not up on the aircraft that is not there, but I can imagine. I think I can fill that, that one in, but... Uh, <laughs> In general, I actually do think the administration is doing the right thing. This is a fairly terrifying situation where no government, Democratic or Republican, has succeeded for 20 plus years. And you know, effectively what we've succeeded, the North Koreans have sold us the same concession every four to six years, right? where we give them negotiations and they say we're going to stop. And they don't stop. Uh, and we negotiate for a while. And nothing happens. And then the game keeps playing. And now they have an arsenal and they're looking you know, to build ICBMs. Secretary Clinton said we need to change this game too. Uh, would she have done it exactly this way? I don't know. But she, re she did think we needed to get a lot tougher. We're as trying to shake something loose, either in Pyongyang or in China, uh, and we're trying to create uncertainty. That's scary. I mean, and there's uncertainty in our own population as well. But it's not clear to me what else we should be doing, unless we just sit back and let them build that arsenal. And, and at some point then, of course, Japan will say, we need, you know, we need a deterrent at the same time. We can't necessarily rely on the U.S. and then South Korea, and then you've got all of East Asia with nuclear weapons. So I, I, um, I think I think this is a game we have to play. I might differ uh, on very specifics, but overall, the notion that we have to ratchet up the pressure and create create uncertainty, and conceivably think about a military strike seems to me the kind of discussion you have to be having. When I say think about a military strike, all options are on the table. Those are conversations people need to be having. Whether you would recommend that, I mean, obviously with Seoul there, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there, but I would certainly be sending these signals. Right. Yes, up front right here, please. Hi, Danny. Hi. <laughs> so um, you've been talking tonight about two different kinds, right? You're talking about the networks between people, and then you're talking about the networks and communities. 
Um, and what I'm wondering is, can you just go into a little bit further of how a digital network and digital connections vary from those in-person connections that you're talking, because you're, I think these are two, you're yep. sort of differentiating between them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and really, I should say, you know, again, I looked at many, many different disciplines and there's a lot of network theory. My point was just, there are plenty of people who think about who gets connected, how, where, and when, uh, and we need to use that. But some of that in sociology, you're talking about social network analysis, you're talking about people, and many people now do this, you know, you can take a corporation or any institution and map an individual's uh, connections. And it comes up with great stuff like if you are looking for a job, you don't want to ask your friends, you want to ask your acquaintances. Because your friends know all the same things you do. That's why you're there are your friends. You have a tight group of people and you all know basically the same jobs that are open or aren't. Your acquaintances, on the other hand, are the people on the outside of your network. They are likely to have networks that are not overlapping with yours and they're more likely to help. So that's sort of classic individuals. Uh, and that's the sort of thing you would look at in a community. And as I say, this, this, these arguments about resilience in communities and, and the density of the networks and also the diversity of the networks, those are people. Digital networks, yes, much bigger, obviously. Uh, and when you talk about a scale-free network, so as I said, this idea that you get uh, a few enormous nodes and then an infinitely long tail, that ha that's digital uh, and could possibly be global and corporate, I think, but I, I would think uh, much more digitally. Um, but those, the lessons from digital networks, because we can see them, we can do experiments, you can observe them, are actually also relevant then to connecting institutions. So knowing, for instance, that uh, left on their own, human beings often will group into a couple big nodes and then lots of smaller ones. If you want to counter that, as I said, then you have to act very specifically make sure those big nodes are broken up into smaller ones. But I would say, and it's in the book, uh, it depends again on what's your scale, who you're connecting, uh, and for what purpose. Uh, and and I, I would repeat what I said to the earlier question, I hope this is just the beginning because there's enough theory out there that people who are thinking about this should be able to answer the, those kinds of questions in a much more fine-grained way. I want to ask another question um, online, uh, which really engages another set of issues that we haven't talked very much about tonight. Uh, the question is, what roles do NGOs play in these networks, and how can they leverage the networks for the humanitarian agenda. Some people have observed that the humanitarian agenda doesn't seem to be a very big priority of this administration. Are there ways that NGOs can use these networks to advance that? Well, I would start by saying that NGOs have become more and more important because they use these networks. And it really, if you look at the big NGOs, they are global networks. With if Think about Doctors Without Borders. Doctors Without Borders has chapters in different countries and networks to doctors in different countries. Uh, but Or again, I would think about climate change where uh, the ability to group together lots of different NGOs into a network uh, has been hugely important. Same thing was true of the International Criminal Court or the Landmines Treaty where Jody Williams and that network uh, actually won uh, the award. You know, on the humanitarian uh, front, the, obviously we can, you can improve the delivery of humanitarian aid by creating strategic networks, but I would I actually would sort of move upstream because I, the humanitarian issues to me are strategic issues. From the network perspective, you do not wait until a country comes apart and you have streams of refugees. You or any conflict where you then have 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 uh, you know horrific humanitarian situations. You're thinking. That's why I said with Syria, you're thinking from the beginning. How do you create networks that will either help you avoid the conflict or help you uh, respond very quickly? Uh, it, it, just as one example, if you were thinking about, um, I think you, in a humanitarian way, I strongly supported safe zones. Part of that was effectively to say, 
uh, you know, if you are going to drive your people out, we're going to effectively take over part of your country. They're going to still be in your country. You're just not going to be have that part of your country under control. So to, I think there are ways you can, you can help NGOs deliver uh, whatever they're delivering better. And I talk about scale networks. I have a whole category of different kinds of scale networks. But, if, but for the humanitarian question, I would often think about it in terms of um, how are we going to build the networks in advance or how are we going to strengthen the existing networks in ways that avoid the worst of these situations? Terrific. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for the conversation tonight. Anne-Marie's book is for sale right over there, and she will be headed over there to be able to sign books and probably ask a question or two as you're doing that as well. Um, at a moment like this where so many big questions are being asked about the world, I think books like this are very helpful to take us back to fundamental principles, to really think about what's going on in the world. And this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you.